Testimony resumed today in the Ohio family massacre trial for defendant George Wagner. Wagner faces 22 charges, including eight counts of aggravated murder in connection to the deaths of eight members of the Roden family back in 2016. Now, last week, state star witness Jake Wagner testified against his brother. Today, the second star witness for the prosecution took the stand, the mother of the defendant, Angela Wagner. She testified against her son as part of a plea agreement in her case. Now, all four members of the Wagner family are charged in connection with the Roden family murders. All right, joining us now from Ohio is Court TV legal correspondent Joylyn Macrick. Joy, great to see you. Now, we heard um, important context about the family dynamics. That's a big part of this case. It was revealed in testimony from Angela Wagner. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so... Angela's testimony really gave us a look into what I would describe as bizarre family dynamics. And this is really important to the state's overarching narrative because part of their argument is that these dynamics led to the murders. Uh, Angela testified, started off her testimony describing the relationship between her son, George, who's the defendant in this case, and his ex-wife, Tabitha Clater. Uh, she testified that essentially when asked to choose between her own family and George and the baby, Tabitha Clater chose to prioritize George and the baby that they had together and essentially cut off her own family, but that ultimately Tabitha did end up cheating on George and that led to a divorce, after which Tabitha was only granted supervised visits with the child. Um, and of course, this kind of plays into the state's narrative that the Wagners had kind of strategized to limit control of, of the biological mothers of these children and really to gain control of these children or Angela's own grandchildren themselves. Um, Angela went on to testify that the victim in this case, one of the victims in this case, Hannah Roden, wanted to have a baby with her son, Jake Wagner, uh, who of course has already pleaded guilty to his role in these crimes and that, quote, Jake and Hannah tried to hide it from Chris for a long time. Chris Roden Sr. being Hannah's father, of course, another one of the victims in this crime. Angela also testified that she herself, not Hannah's own parents, took Hannah to the clinic while Hannah was pregnant because, quote, she was carrying my grandchild. And, and Michael, we do anticipate hearing testimony about these children being instructed to call Angela their mother, even though she was a grandmother. And in fact, Angela already shared during her testimony that at least uh, for the child Bullvine, uh, Bullvine, the, the child of the defendant, slept with Angela instead of with his own parents. Now, Joey, we know that the mom wasn't at the shooting. She wasn't at the crime scenes, but I understand she went into detail about what ultimately motivated the killings. Tell us about that. Yeah, and again, Angela Wagner pleaded guilty to conspiracy and several other charges. Uh, she's now spending part of her 30-year sentence in prison. She's already done so, I should say, uh, three years at least at this point. But she testified that when her granddaughter Sophie actually stayed with her mom, Hannah Roden, again, one of the victims in this crime, after the split from Jake Wagner, that appeared she, Sophie had been, quote, um, suffering some kind of abuse and, quote, her little private area was extremely red very puffy. And that's when Angela says that she and her family decided they needed to regain control of Sophie and quote, our plan was they had to be murdered, referring to, of course, the Roden family. And that's exactly what the state argued in their opening statement. So let's listen. We show uh, Jake, at least his awards um, card being used to buy 76932 ammo and a magazine for an SKS, also in April. There was a phone jammer purchased by Angela. A phone jammer jams signals for phones. So say you're gonna go murder eight people and you don't want them to be able to call for help, then you have a phone jammer on your person and it jams the signals. It's actually illegal because it can interfere with um, aircraft and such. So, um, but that was purchased and a bug detector um, was purchased by Angela. Um, there were fi the financial records also just confirm what we already knew, which was this is a very, um, they function as one unit and pretty much everything they do financially is no exception. 
Yeah, and, and that's part of the state's argument that Angela Wagner really helped strategize at plan and prepare for these killings, which they say George Wagner, the defendant in this case, ultimately helped to carry out. All right, Joey, what else did we learn today from all the testimony? Yeah, I mean, so we learned actually that Billy Wagner uh, really was the mastermind behind all of this, that it was really, according to Angela, his idea to, to kill the rodents, that there were several other ideas that were mulled over as a family, such as using the, the legal system to actually regain custody of Sophie. But Billy ultimately decided that the only way was to, to kill Hannah and that they couldn't stop short of killing Hannah Roden, the mother of Sophie, but they would have to kill Chris. Chris Roden Sr. because he ultimately uh, exercised control over Hannah Roden and, and the Roden family and that other witnesses, other members of the Roden family would have to be killed for it to be successful. That's essentially what Angela testified and that, that really was Billy who was the driver here. Yeah, I think that actually mirrored what, what Jake said as well about Billy Wagner's involvement, that he seemed to be the guy that was driving, the driving force behind the actual murders. All right, Gerald Macron, thank you so much for that report. Appreciate it. As always, we'll speak to you again soon. Let me bring back in my guests with me this hour, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borghardt. C.K., glad to have you back. I'll start with you. Um, Gosh, you got the brother taking the stand initially, then you got the mom taking the stand, really kind of outlining how this entire conspiracy went down. Um, if you have to, how, how do you go after um, a witness like the mom who's basically filling in all the blanks that I think were a problem for prosecutors? They didn't really have all the blanks filled in during their case prior to them testifying, but now they're doing a great job of filling it in with these last two witnesses. Well, you know, the mom, to turn on your son mm -hmm. or sons is incredibly impactful. She raised these children. She set the tone. She set the stage. And she's just as culpable in terms of the conspiracy. So her testimony is very impactful, impactful in terms of the conviction of her son, George. But it's really, this is just heinous, tragic um, you know, there are so many layers of this, but no matter what was happening to the children, to massacre an entire family was completely unwarranted, inexcusable, and also illegal. And to hear this mother, that she raised these children and in her role is equally as disturbing, very, very, very disturbing. So you can see why the kids did the things that they did, because as a family, they move together in criminal activity and they kill together in criminal activity. You know what's interesting, Franz, and, and CK raises an interesting point, that these kids, um, and again, they're not children, they were in their 20s, you got Jake, you got George, um, they were taking cues from the parents. I mean, that, that, that becomes clear here. They also, there's a number of things that came out during Jake's testimony, may come out again during Angela's testimony as she continues, that George was at one of the shooting scenes but didn't shoot. Um, George didn't want to do it. Um, seems like dad was the real master, mastermind behind this decision to kill. And that they were motivated by this sense that somehow this child at the center of all this might have been the victim of abuse or abuse going forward. Does any of that help the defense at all. Remember, this is a conspiracy case, so it's not like they have to prove he pulled the trigger. So juries like equity. So if you start trying to hold a potentially less culpable individual, even in a conspiracy, um, they don't always like that. Now, that doesn't mean they're gonna necessarily give a free pass, um, but now we're starting to talk about, we, we get into a conversation about lesser included, responsive verdicts. Um, juries also don't normally have warm and fuzzy feelings for people who sexually abuse children. Does that mean that they're gonna give a pass to a, uh, a murderer who's attached to a conspiracy? Maybe, maybe not. Not being the shooter, maybe, maybe not. But cumulatively, Michael, these things adding up does that put him in a position to possibly argue for something less than what he's on trial for? And keep in mind, last big thing, part of the deal of the cooperating family members, if I'm not mistaken, was to take death penalty off the table. So these are all elements of what's going on. A defense that may get him off, not necessarily, but a defense that may put him in a better position if he's committed, maybe so. And I think at this point, CK, that's really all um, the defense can hope for. But that leads me to my question. Um, 
one thing that we've seen throughout this trial, one thing we've commented on, is that there hasn't been a tremendous amount of evidence actually linking George to these terrible crimes. That we, we only have Jake's testimony, now we have Mom's testimony. Certainly powerful, but is that enough? Uh, for this jury, is going to, to Franz's point, to, to really want to convict him on these horrible, horrible crimes. I think it is, because anytime you have a mother that's testifying against a son and a brother testifying against a son, and this is all, this entire family appears to be demented and that they're all in it together. They all plan this. And, and at the end of the day, we don't know what the evidence is of the child's abuse. Jurors don't like to see children abused. None of us do. But when you compare what allegedly was going on, we haven't seen the evidence yet, with what this family conspired to do, I'm going to um, convict all of them, hmm. all of them. And the only question is whether they will get the death penalty. That's it. I think they're all going to get convicted because the story that's being told is demented. It sounds awful. And the jurors are probably sitting there shaking their heads, wondering how could this have happened? And how could people have gone this far and massacred an entire family over a custody issue? Yeah, and at the end of the day, Franz, I wonder if the things that I mentioned before, the fact that he didn't shoot, the fact that he didn't really want to be involved in this type of thing, but went along with this family, if that becomes more of an issue at sentencing than it does in the actual trial. So the, the common wisdom of most defense attorneys is letters are not as good as numbers. So if you're looking at a life sentence, um, having a number is much better, even if it's an astronomically big number. Right. So potentially at sentencing, it could come into play, potentially into considering a lesser charge that carries a lesser sentence. Um, I don't, I, I agree. I don't think this guy's gonna walk, but I think they are, there are some gingerbread crumbs that have been led to possibly a responsive verdict or a lesser included verdict, which may get this guy an outdate, which is all that the defense probably cares about. Yeah, and, and maybe Jake's master plan of taking the death penalty off the table may help in the long run when it does come to sentencing. As you said, those years may shrink a little bit based on all these facts that we're hearing about the case.